Hey ho, woke up freezing cold and totally confused. It was September 6th, 2007, and all Carlos could remember was being on his motorcycle with the hot sun bearing down on him as he wound his way on his bike through the streets of La Victoria, which is a city in Venezuela. Carlos tried to open his eyes, but he couldn't, and then when he tried to move his body, he couldn't do that either. And so he began to panic because he's paralyzed, but he told himself to calm down. If he couldn't move, at least he could think. He could try to process, you know, what's going on here. There has to be an explanation for it. And so Carlos, in total darkness and immobile, began going through over and over again this whole motorcycle trip, which was his last memory. And he remembered that his friend had called him up and asked him to go out on this ride. Carlos used to go out all the time on his bike for fun with his friends and by himself, but now that he was 33 years old and married, he didn't have the time for it as much. But the weather had been so beautiful that when his friend had called and asked to go out, Carlos said, let's do it. And so Carlos began going over in his head the route that they had taken through La Victoria, and all he could remember was this long straightaway and then a right turn, and then nothing. It was like after he made that turn, everything went blank. And as Carlos thought about how weird it was that one, he was paralyzed, and two, he had no memory of what happened after he made that right turn, he started to realize that he felt something against his back. It was like there was a block underneath his back, kind of right between his shoulder blades, propping his chest up, and he felt his arms kind of dangling down by the side, and it was very uncomfortable. And as he laid in this totally awkward position, he began to hear somewhere out in the ether unfamiliar voices just kind of chatting, and immediately Carlos is like, okay, someone's here to help me. I don't know what's wrong with me, but somebody's here, I'm going to be okay. And soon, whoever was talking near Carlos had moved closer to him, and actually Carlos began to realize that it was actually more than one person. It was at least two people talking back and forth, but again, Carlos can't open his eyes, he can't move, he can't communicate with these people, he just knows they've come closer to him. And after these people had moved right up against Carlos, Carlos suddenly felt something metal pressing up against his chin. And it was kind of sharp and it kind of hurt when it touched his chin. And Carlos wanted to scream out and tell them whatever they were doing to stop and at least tell him what was going on. But Carlos couldn't make a sound. And then Carlos began to hear this kind of mechanical whirring sound, like a machine starting up that was very close to where he was. And suddenly Carlos began panicking, like, what's going on? What are they doing to me? And as Carlos's heart rate is starting to speed up, one of the people who had moved near Carlos suddenly said, oh my God, that's impossible. This can't be. And then again, Carlos felt more pain in his chin. And then the pain got dramatically worse. It went from just kind of like a poking feeling to something going into his chin and he felt it moving underneath his skin like a knife cutting through him and then whatever it was it went out of his chin and as this is happening Carlos is trying so hard to just wake himself up and do something to tell these people to stop but he just couldn't do it and then again he felt that sharp pain in his chin another round of something going into him moving underneath his skin and then poking out again and the pain became so blinding that suddenly Carlos was able able to kind of break through this paralysis and his eyes shot open. And for a second, all Carlos could see was like blinding lights. But then as things came into focus, he saw there were two people, the people who had been speaking, wearing these huge goggles and face masks. And one of them was holding a big needle with black thread attached to it. And that thread was coming from Carlos's chin. They had been running that needle through his face, stitching his chin for some reason, but with no anesthetic. And so as Carlos is staring up at these people in goggles, the people in goggles are looking down at Carlos and they're totally horrified. And they just kind of begin backing up, not really sure what to make of this. And then Carlos, again, kind of breaking through this weird paralysis he was under, he was able to lift his head up and look down at his body. And he saw, to his horror, that he was totally nude. He was laying on a metal table and there was this Y drawn on his chest, starting at his collarbones, coming down right underneath his throat and then straight down across his chest. And then after Carlos saw this Y on his naked body, he looked over at a tray that was right next to this metal table near these two guys and goggles who were now kind of backing up and he saw there was a whirring instrument on this table and it was a circular blade a saw that was the sound he heard and that's when Carlos figured it out 
Earlier that day, when Carlos had been out riding his motorcycle with his friend, he had gone down that long straightaway in La Victoria, he had made a right turn, and parked illegally right after this turn was this big truck. Carlos didn't see it, and at full speed, he impacted the truck, he was thrown from his bike, smashed into the ground, horrific injuries, and when paramedics showed up, they pronounced him dead on the scene. And so he was moved from the scene of the accident to the morgue. And at the morgue, Carlos was stripped naked and put on this metal table, and they placed a block underneath his shoulders, kind of propping his chest up, and they drew a Y down the center of his chest for his autopsy. The two doctors that Carlos ultimately saw chatting and performing this autopsy were gonna follow that Y on his body with the circular saw. That's how they cut you open during an autopsy. But right before they were about to do that, the doctors noticed that Carlos was actively bleeding from his chin. And since he was supposed to be dead, that didn't make any sense. And so that was why one of the doctors had said, oh my goodness, this can't be. And so not really sure what to make of it, they had just grabbed a needle and begun stitching his face together to stop the blood from going down his chest. And then Carlos opened his eyes and it dawned on the two doctors that, oh, he's alive. That's why he's still bleeding. We should definitely take care of him now. But amazingly, after Carlos came back from the dead, he was simply moved into the hallway and left on this metal table, and the doctors who were going to perform his autopsy just left the paper that said he needed an autopsy in his pocket, just kind of showing that, hey, we were just following orders, somebody told us to give you an autopsy, this is not our fault. And that's where Carlos stayed until his wife showed up and found him in the hallway, just laying there as if he was still just waiting for his autopsy. Carlos would suffer horrible injuries from the accident and serious emotional trauma from almost being cut open during this autopsy, but he would make a full recovery. On the afternoon of May 11th, 2015, 55-year-old Natalia was gathering sap inside of a Russian forest with her 82-year-old friend, Falia. The two of them had been coming to this grove of birch trees for many years. They enjoyed the peace and solitude of nature, and it was also a good place for Natalia to bring her little dog so he could run around while they collected the sap. It was a perfect spring day. The weather was very mild, the sun was out, and the two friends had a great time just kind of moving around to the different birch trees, using their little drills and hammers to get their taps into the tree, and then they'd put their glass bottles underneath each tap to collect their harvest. And then at some point, Natalia Natalia felt like she had all the sap she would need, and she began gathering up her things to get ready to leave. And as she did that, she looked over at Valia, and she had found this really big birch tree, and she had sat down underneath it and was working hard to set her tap. And so as Natalia registered that Valia was over here, kind of doing one more tree before they left, she began looking around for her dog. And she found her dog, and he wasn't too far away from Valia, and he was just kind of moseying around one of the trees, when suddenly Natalia noticed the dog came to a hard stop and it turned and looked deeper into the forest, like it had clearly registered something that had put it on alert that was out of view. And so Natalia, her view was obscured from whatever the dog was looking at. And so she put down her equipment and kind of moved between the trees to see what her dog was looking at. And at some point her view cleared and she saw pretty far off in the forest was something huge, this dark thing kind of moving behind the trees. And suddenly it jumped out from behind the trees and ran towards the dog. It was a huge Russian brown bear. And so totally horrified, Natalia's watching this bear charge her dog. She looks over, she sees Valia, who's pretty hard of hearing, is sitting with her back to this bear and the dog, still just working on this tree. And Natalia's just frozen for a moment, having no idea what to do. And then instinct suddenly took over and Natalia just turned and began running away, leaving Valia and leaving the dog. But after only running several paces, she stopped and turned around and saw the bear is still trying to attack the dog, but the dog is standing its ground and barking at the bear, which is kind of causing it to back up and be a little unsure of itself, even though this dog is so much smaller. And still, Valia is not reacting at all. She has not heard the bear, the dog, nothing. And Natalia, she's looking back, knowing that she needs to do something. She can't just let her friend and her dog get killed. And so Natalia began walking slowly
Emily back in the direction of this bear, and she begins screaming at Valia to get up and run with her. But the second Natalia began screaming, the bear went from looking at the dog to turning and looking at Natalia, and suddenly it was like the dog meant nothing. The bear had decided it was going to go after Natalia. And so Natalia, she's staring at this bear, realizing, oh my God, it's gonna charge me. But before she could even turn to run, the bear had ran at full speed and jumped at her. Natalia turned and she tried to run, but the bear bit down on her thigh and she felt it crush her leg and pull her to the ground and whip her up against a nearby birch tree. And she's screaming and trying to pull herself away but the bear is ripping at her leg trying to yank her back into the forest and then Natalia she sees her little drill that she uses to set the tap in the trees and she reaches out and she grabs it and she turns and her leg is being actively eaten by this bear and she turns on the drill and she's about to jam it into the bear's eye when the bear suddenly stands up to its full height and then just falls all its weight down onto Natalia's chest and immediately Natalia dropped the drill and the bear clenched down on her throat. Now at this point, Valia, who again is hard of hearing, she didn't know what was going on, she turned around and saw this bear mauling her friend. And so what does she do? She runs over to this bear right behind it and begins pummeling this bear and screaming at it to get off her friend. And the bear, who barely registers Valia hitting it, it just lets go of Natalia for a second, it turns around, and you gotta remember, this bear has been eating Natalia. Its face is covered in her blood, and it turns and looks at Valia, and Valia, she's terrified, she begins stumbling backwards, and the bear is clearly about to jump on Valia when Natalia, who's barely alive, she sees this happening, and she just begins screaming at this bear while she's laying there bleeding out, trying to attract the bear to come back and keep eating her to spare Valia. And it works. The bear, hearing Natalia screaming behind it, forgets about Valia and turns back around and resumes eating Natalia. And then just seconds later, the bear actually lifted up Natalia by her neck and it ran off into the woods carrying her. And so Valia is just left watching this happen. She knows she's not gonna be able to stop this bear. And so she just begins running back towards the car, which was not that far from where they were. And when she got out there, she grabbed her phone and she called the authorities. About an hour and a half later, hunters sent by the police, along with animal control, arrived at this parking lot and they found Valia, who was totally in shock. And she would tell the hunters and animal control where this birch tree grove was, where all this happened. And a moment later, the authorities headed into the woods. And after arriving at the birch tree grove, they actually saw the bear. It was by itself and it turned and looked at them and it began charging them. And they all raised their rifles and they fired at the bear. And they shot it enough times that the bear collapsed right in front of them. And then they shot it one more time to make sure the bear was dead. But there was no sign of Natalia anywhere. But then suddenly the authorities turned and saw something move off in the distance. And out from behind a tree came Natalia's little dog. It had somehow not sustained any injuries from this bear, even though the bear had originally gone after the dog. And the dog, it came up to the authorities and then quickly doubled back behind a tree. And so kind of operating on instinct, Instinct, the group followed the dog around the tree and they saw the dog was closely guarding this kind of mound that was covered in sticks and leaves and dirt. And so one of the hunters walked over and looked down and they realized there was a person underneath this mound. It was Natalia. They pulled off all of the dirt and the twigs and they found her absolutely destroyed, mauled body. But Natalia was actually still alive. Brown bears are notorious for eating their prey while they are still alive. And in many cases, they will gravely wound their prey, but not let it die because then the meat is fresher when they come back and eat it later. And so bears will wound their prey and then basically bury them, cover them up with sticks and dirt, kind of like putting it in the fridge and then come back and eat them later on. And so Natalia was earmarked to be eaten later because she was still alive and buried. Natalia was rushed out of the forest to a nearby hospital and she would stay there for several weeks because she had serious, serious injuries from this bear. All over her body were these huge bite marks and a lot of the flesh from her leg had been pulled off. But amazingly, she would recover, although the trauma of merely being eaten by a bear has never left her. 
Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. I grew up in a family where talking about our feelings was totally normal. And so as a result, I remember thinking that I would never be depressed because I'd be able to get ahead of whatever I was dealing with before it became a much bigger issue. But fast forward to 2017 when I had just left the military and I was trying to find my way in the civilian world and suddenly I just felt mad all the time even though I didn't know why. But instead of talking about my feelings to someone like I had been raised to do, I just bottled that anger up and eventually it turned into a full-blown depression. It turns out the reason I was able to talk about my feelings when I was a kid was because I wasn't really struggling. But as an adult, when I had real mental health issues, suddenly talking about what was going on with me felt impossible. Luckily, when I was struggling, my family noticed and they convinced me to go see a therapist and truly it changed my life. So if you're struggling right now and you're just bottling up the way you're feeling, stop doing that and consider going to therapy. And a very easy entry point into therapy is BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a highly reviewed online therapy platform, which means you can get the help you need right from the comfort of your own home. Get matched with a BetterHelp therapist after filling out a brief survey, then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's via text, chat, voice, or video. You can also switch therapists at any time at no additional cost. Go to our sponsor, betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin for 10% off your first month of therapy with BetterHelp and get matched with a therapist who will listen and help. On the afternoon of May 25th, 2017, 42-year-old Nicole Gordon was laying on her couch in her home in Atlanta, Georgia with an ice pack on her head. She had a blinding headache, one of the worst headaches she had ever had, and she was just unable to do anything else but lay on the couch. Nicole really had no idea why she had this terrible headache. The only thing she could think of was three weeks earlier, she had been in a minor car accident and one of her car windows had broken and some of the glass had cut her face, but she didn't think that would be enough to lead to this absolutely horrific headache that had not gone away for three weeks. But Nicole was a very tough woman, and even though she had thought about going to the hospital over these past three weeks to deal with whatever was causing this headache, she had told herself that, you know, it's gotta be something minor, I just need to kind of tough it out here. And what toughing it out looked like was laying on the couch all day long, only getting up to eat and go to the bathroom, not going to work, and just sitting in the darkness with this ice pack, just hoping for this headache to go away. And so as Nicole was just laying there, she heard her back door open up. It was her boyfriend, Geronte, coming in with groceries. He came inside and he put the groceries away. And then he came into the living room where she was and he asked how she was doing. And she told him that the headache had not gone away yet. And would he mind going into the kitchen and getting her some ibuprofen, which are pain meds, as well as some water. And so Geronte said, of course, he went in the kitchen. He got what she needed. He brought it back. She said, thank you. She took the ibuprofen. And then she went back to just being totally miserable. But just a second later, Nicole and Geronte heard a knock at the front door and Geronte, he walked over and kind of casually looked through the blinds to see if he could see who was at the front door. And he saw it was Nicole's best friend, Leisha. But instead of going to the door and opening it, Geronte turned to Nicole and said, hey, it's Leisha, do you want me to get the door? And Nicole, she just kind of grunted and said, no, please just ignore her. Even though Nicole and Leisha were very close, Nicole knew that Leisha was very high energy. She had been calling and texting basically nonstop ever since Nicole had begun getting these headaches. Leisha just wanted to help and kind of be around and be a part of her recovery. But Nicole just couldn't deal with that super high energy right now. She could barely have a conversation without her head hurting even more. And she knew that Leisha and Geronte didn't really get along too well. And, and so Nicole figured it would just be better for everybody if they pretended no one was home and Leisha just went on her merry way. But Leisha was very persistent and just continued knocking really loud on the front door. She began calling Nicole's phone. And so Nicole began reaching over and silencing her phone over and over again. And finally, Nicole looked over at Geronte and just said, I don't need this. I'm going into my bedroom and I'm lying down. And so she grabbed her phone, she stood up off the couch, you know, she could barely move, her head hurt so bad. And she walked, you know, quietly past the front door, made her way into her bedroom, and she was about to lay down on the bed when she made the mistake of opening up her blinds just a little bit. Her room was on the front of the house as well, and she wanted to see if Leisha was still there. And when she opened those blinds, 
Leisha, who was outside, happened to be looking at Nicole's bedroom and the two of them made eye contact. And Nicole's like, oh my God, she knows I'm here. And so Nicole, she just shuts the blinds. But now Leisha comes up to the window and she's yelling, Nicole, I know you're there. Come on, let me in. I want to help you. But Nicole, she just could not deal with it. And so she laid down on her bed and just continued to totally ignore Leisha. Nicole knew that no matter how offended and upset Leisha was for this snub, she would get over it because the two women had been friends for nearly two decades. 19 years earlier, they had been neighbors and they had become friends really quickly. They had been pregnant at the same time and they began raising their kids kind of like side by side. But in the last five years that Nicole and Durante had been together, Nicole and Leisha had kind of drifted apart because Leisha and Durante both had very strong personalities and they just kind of clashed. And Nicole and Durante had this kind of on again, off again relationship. And every time they were broken up, Leisha would come around and be totally unfiltered with Nicole about how much she didn't like Durante. But right now, Nicole could just not deal with Leisha. And so despite hearing her yelling for her to come outside, come on, I know you're in there. Nicole just rolled over on her bed with a rice pack on the side of her head and she fell asleep. A few hours later, when Nicole woke up, Leisha was gone, as well as Durante. He didn't stick around for very long. He often would only come over just to check in, and then he'd go off and do his own thing. And so Nicole, who still had this blinding headache, she sat up, she got out of her bed, and she was only able to walk back out into the living room where she laid down on the couch and just went right back to sleep. Even though Nicole had had this headache for three weeks and it had not gotten any better, she really was convinced that taking enough ibuprofen and relaxing long enough would cause it to go away. But over the next couple of days, this headache, which was already like a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale to Nicole, somehow became like a 20 out of 10, and it got so bad that she couldn't even open her eyes. It was like horrific. And as this headache got so, so, so bad, her relationship with Geronte started to sour. Geronte didn't really believe that Nicole was actually in the amount of pain that she was in, and he kind of began acting like she was just being lazy. And this really upset Nicole because that wasn't true at all. She was just in blinding pain and couldn't do anything. Finally, in late June, so five weeks after Nicole's headaches had begun, and at this point, her headache had still not gone away, she was laying on the couch, like always, with the lights off, she's got the ice pack on her head, and she's just trying to get through the day, when she hears the back door open, and it's Durante, and he comes in, he slams the back door, he doesn't even say hello, and he just storms into the living room, and just looks down at her with a totally disapproving look. And Nicole, she kind of looked over at him, and when she saw that look on his face, she had just had it and she said you know what we're done and immediately Geronte got so mad and he's like how dare you I've been taking care of you for the past five weeks bringing you groceries this and that and Nicole she had no energy to fight with him and so she just let him rant and rave until finally he was done and he walked out and she was like thank goodness a few days later on June 25th Leisha was back at Nicole's house knocking on the door Nicole had actually texted her to let her know that she had officially ended things with Geronte. And so feel free to come over. You know, there's not going to be any drama with him being here. And so Leisha had come back over. She was very excited to see Nicole and kind of get over the snafu of her being ignored. And when she knocked, Nicole did go up to the door and she opened it up. And Leisha, as soon as she saw Nicole, this is like the first time she's seeing her since Nicole's headaches had really begun. She knew something was definitely wrong with with Nicole. Her entire apartment is totally dark, all the windows are covered up, and Nicole is squinting out at Leisha, kind of beckoning her to come inside. And Leisha's like, oh my gosh, like how bad is this headache? And Nicole could barely make a sentence and she just said, oh, it's so bad, it's so bad. And so Leisha came inside and Nicole led her through the dark apartment to the kitchen and back. And Nicole, she sat down and Leisha sat down opposite her. And Leisha began asking Nicole questions about her headache, about Geronte, just kind of about her life. And quickly, Leisha realized that Nicole really wasn't making any sense. Her answers, even to the simplest questions like, what did you eat today, were in fragments and didn't really make any sense. And finally, Leisha said to Nicole, hey, this can't be a normal headache. This is something serious. You need to go to the hospital. And at this point, even though Nicole had been trying so hard to just kind of white knuckle her way through whatever was going on in hopes it would go away, you know, she was starting to realize that there was something wrong here and she needed help from a doctor. And so Nicole agreed to go. 
And so Leisha would help Nicole up and kind of assist her out of the apartment and into Leisha's car. And Leisha would take her to the hospital. And when they got there, Leisha brought Nicole into the emergency room. And she explained to the nurses and doctors that Nicole had this terrible migraine. It started after she was in this minor car accident five weeks earlier. And so the doctors and nurses brought Nicole back to one of the rooms and they began kind of treating her the way they would any other patient who had a serious headache. They asked her if she was hydrated. They asked what medication she was taking. They asked her what she was eating, how much sleep she was getting. They were just kind of going down the list of different things that could cause this headache, but nothing stood out as a red flag. Even the fact that she had been in this minor car accident and had some cuts on her face from the glass, that really wasn't enough for them to think, oh yeah, that would cause five weeks of a persistent migraine-like headache. They even looked at the cuts on her face to see if maybe they were infected or something, but they weren't. Basically, they had no idea what was causing this. But the doctors and nurses were very concerned because persistent extreme pain in your head could be signs of a stroke or an aneurysm or something, both of which can be fatal. So they put Nicole through a series of imaging scans to get a look inside of her head to try to figure out what was going on. And after they finished all these scans, Nicole was brought back to her hospital room and she laid down on the bed. And even though she felt terrible still because of this headache, she at least felt like, okay, finally, you know, these people are gonna figure out what's wrong with me. They're gonna give me medication. This headache's gonna go away and I can get back to my normal life. But only a few minutes later, as Nicole is laying there trying to get comfortable, the door to her room suddenly burst open and a swarm of people came into the room looking very concerned. And in the middle of all these people was a guy wearing a suit and he walked up to Nicole and he said he was a police detective and he held up one of her scans and he pointed at it. But to understand what he was pointing at on her scan, we need to go back and look at what really happened on the day that Nicole got into that minor car accident. Back in early May of 2017, Nicole and Durante, who were still dating at this point, had just come back to Nicole's house after the two of them had been at a house party together. And Nicole was furious with Durante because at this house party, he had been openly flirting with another woman right in front of Nicole. And so Nicole, after going into her house, brought it up to Durante about how disrespectful that was. And Durante, instead of being apologetic or trying to defend himself or even lie about it, he actually just got really mad at Nicole and said, you know what, fine, I'm breaking up with you. And then he began going around her house, gathering up all of his things that he had left inside of her house. And Nicole, truthfully, was so mad that she didn't really care that he was putting on this show of taking his stuff and leaving her. And so after a few minutes of Durante angrily grabbing his stuff from inside the house, he headed outside to Nicole's car where he had some more things inside of her car. And so he went in the passenger seat and Nicole, she just reflexively got into the driver's seat of the car just to make sure that Durante didn't take anything inside of her car that he shouldn't or mess with her car in some way to get revenge on her. And so she's sitting there, she's watching Durante right next to her, gather up his things. And then he hops out of the car, doesn't say a word to her. And then he walked around the front of her car and got into his car, which was parked right in front of hers, facing out towards the road. He climbed into the driver's seat, shut the door, and then he didn't move. And so Nicole, she's still sitting in her car, looking at Durante, hoping that he's just gonna leave now, but he wasn't. And so suddenly feeling so frustrated and mad at him for everything, she turned on her car and drove forward, not fast or anything, and bumped intentionally into the back of Durante's car, and then she backed up to where she had been. And after she did that, she stared angrily at Durante, basically being like, what? Like, I want you to leave, like, get out of here. And Durante, he was furious. And so he threw his car in reverse and he really hit the gas and rammed into the front of Nicole's car. And in fact, he hit her car so hard that her car lurched backwards and smashed into her fence. Now, Nicole's memory only showed her this exchange. She remembered fighting with Durante, him getting his stuff, and then her bumping into him, and then him really hard smashing into her. And so when she thought about the minor accident she had gotten into, this was it. But what Nicole did not know as she was laying in the hospital bed, as this detective is holding up the scan and pointing at it, is there was actually a whole other series of events that played out after Durante backed into her. After Durante backed into Nicole and she smashed into her fence, Durante got out of his car, walked up to Nicole's car, drew a gun, 
and shot Nicole in the head. That's what happened. This was not a glass cut. This mark on her forehead was where the bullet went into her skull. But obviously, this did not kill Nicole. It knocked her unconscious, and Gerante picked her up, put her in his car, and drove her to his mother's house, where he told his mother that, oh, Nicole was drunk and she got into a small accident and, you know, she just needs to rest. And so Gerante's mom, believing her son, put some Neosporin on Nicole's entry wound from the gunshot, put a band over it and kind of looked after her for the night and then when Nicole came to she had no idea what happened her memory only existed up until Gerante rammed into her she didn't remember him getting out and shooting her and all of that and so when Gerante realized that Nicole didn't know he shot her he just went along with it and said oh yeah you got drunk and you know we were fighting a little bit and you got into a small accident and I think the glass fell down and cut your head you know that's all that happened and Nicole believed it. It wasn't until Leisha made Nicole go to the hospital five weeks later and they scanned her head that they discovered a bullet lodged in her brain. And so the detective came in the room holding up the scan and he pointed to the bright spot on the scan and that was the bullet. And the doctors and nurses, they told Nicole that we've never seen anything like this, like you should be dead. And also because this has gone untreated for five weeks, your body healed around the bullet. Like we can't even take it out now. Your brain has formed itself around the bullet. And so it will do more damage than good if we try to pull it out. And so Nicole would go on to live her life with this bullet in her head, but she never really fully recovered. As for Durante, the police would very quickly go after him, but he would flee police and evade them for two years. And then finally, when they caught up to him, he was hiding in an attic and there was this whole long standoff, but then finally he would surrender himself and then he would get charged with a host of crimes, many of which he was convicted of. And and so ultimately he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. 21st, 2020, 58-year-old Aristides Polino was driving back to his home in Miami, Florida in his police SUV after completing a midnight shift. Aristides was a 25-year veteran of the Miami police force, and over the last two plus decades, he had routinely done midnight shifts, so this was nothing new. When he got to his house, he parked his SUV in the driveway, and like always, he went right into his house. He didn't talk to his wife, Clara, or his son. He just went straight up to his bedroom and immediately fell asleep. About four hours later at 5 p.m. Aristides woke up and he expected to hear his wife's voice somewhere in the house. So when he didn't and the house was just totally silent, something told him that something was off. So he climbed out of bed, he put on his clothes, and he went downstairs to look for his wife. When he got down to the living room, he saw his son sitting on the couch, but he didn't see his wife. And so he asked his son, you know, hey, have you seen your mom? And he would say, no, I haven't seen her. But sensing on his dad's face that something was wrong, he said, hey, I'll help you look for mom. And so the two men began searching the house, yelling out for Clara, and Aristides began calling his wife, but she wasn't picking up. And after several minutes, the two men reconvened in the living room, and they started going over whether or not she had told them about some appointment that day and that would explain why she wasn't in the house but after talking about it they decided that she didn't have any appointments and she should be home right now and so the men decided you know maybe she went outside and she's talking to a neighbor or you know she went for a walk and she's talking to somebody on the road and so they decided they would go outside and search the outside of the property when they got outside Aristides went towards the back of the property and his son went towards the front down towards the driveway and so as Aristides is making his way around the back of the property, he hears his son scream out for help. Aristides comes running back around the property and he sees his son standing in the driveway with the door of his police SUV wide open. Four hours earlier, after Aristides came home, he parked his police SUV right in the driveway like he always did, and for some reason he left the car unlocked. And so he goes in the house and he falls asleep. And while he was sleeping, Clara, who was home, she exited the house and walked down the driveway to his SUV. She opened up the door and and went inside. It's believed she was looking for something, although we don't know what she was looking for. And while she was in the back of his car, fishing around for whatever it was she was looking for, the door she had entered the vehicle in shut behind her. And because this is a police SUV, the back seat was designated for suspects. And so the back two doors did not open from the inside. And there was a very thick partition separating the back seat from the front seat. So Clara could not just reach over the seats and honk the horn to get someone's attention. And 
Clara did not have her cell phone, so she couldn't call anyone for help. And when she screamed out for help to somebody out on the road to help her, her screams were severely muffled, and the back windows of this police car were heavily tinted, making it extremely difficult to see that there was a person in the back seat of this car. So for four hours, Clara desperately screamed and kicked and punched and did everything she could to try to free herself from the situation she was in. All the while, the temperature inside the car continued to go up. The SUV was parked in full sunlight, no shade whatsoever, and the temperatures that day were over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so by the time Clara was ultimately discovered, the inside of that SUV had effectively become an oven. Aristides ran over to his vehicle and he pulled his wife out and he started doing CPR on her, but it was too late. She had died of heat stroke. Her death was ultimately ruled an accident. On May 22nd, 2021, a father and his young son were out for a walk in their small suburban town just outside of Barcelona, Spain. When they reached their downtown, they were going to turn around and walk back home, but the boy pleaded with his father to make a quick stop at the old theater. The reason the boy and many other kids in the town loved going to this old theater was because out front of it was this huge paper mache statue of a dinosaur, a stegosaurus to be exact. And so after a little bit of convincing, the father finally agrees and they start heading in that direction. After they turned the corner and could actually see the dinosaur statue, the boy took off running while the father just stayed back and walked leisurely watching his son the whole time. And as he's watching his son, he can see he gets right up to the statue and then the boy just kind of suddenly stops and stares at something on the bottom of the statue. And so the father notices his son has seen something peculiar enough to make him stop and stare. And so he yells to his son, hey, what do you see? And the son just points at the back right leg of the statue. And so the father thinks this is really weird, so he just jogs up to his son and he crouches down right next to him and looks in the direction his son is pointing. And at first, the father believes all his son is pointing at is this fairly obvious crack on the outside of the statue on the back right leg. And he's thinking his son has just noticed that the statue is kind of falling apart. But as he's looking at this crack that his son is pointing at, he realized his son was not pointing at the crack. He was pointing at what was behind the crack, what was inside the dinosaur statue. And when the father realized what he was looking at, he grabbed his son, stood up, and ran in the other direction and called emergency services. A few minutes later, the police and fire department show up in front of this old theater. They get out and they go up to the statue and they confirm what's inside this back right leg. Afterwards, they go to their trucks and they get out chainsaws. Eventually, they were able to carve a big enough square on this back right leg that they were able to remove the thing that the father and the son had seen originally, and that was a dead man's body. Not much is known about this dead man, except that he was a 39-year-old man who his family had reported missing a couple of days before he was actually found. While we don't know this for sure, it's believed he decided to crawl inside the statue when he realized the belly of the dinosaur was movable. Now, it's not entirely clear how he figured that out, Either the belly was already moved and he saw the opening and so saw the opportunity to crawl inside for some reason, or he was poking and prodding at the statue and discovered the belly was movable, moved it aside, and then again seized the opportunity and crawled inside. But either way, the man crawled inside the statue, and then once he was in the dinosaur, his phone slipped out of his hand or slipped out of his pocket, and then instead of falling out of the dinosaur onto the ground, it fell inside the dinosaur and slid down the inside of the statue until it fell into the bottom of the bottom right hand leg. And so the man decides to go after his phone and so on his belly he slides over to the back right leg and then he begins lowering himself head first into the leg reaching for his phone. And so as he's kind of slowly lowering himself down using his legs to pin himself inside the statue he gets closer and closer and he's almost about to grab his phone when his feet lose their grip and he slips and falls head first all the way to the bottom of this back right leg. The space he was in was so tight he was not able to turn himself around and climb up and out again. In fact, it was so tight he could barely move. His arms were pinned by his side and so he couldn't use them to even push himself back up and out. And because he could not bend his legs, he could not use his legs to pull himself back out again either. And so this man most likely began screaming for help, but for whatever reason, nobody heard him. And so after what must have been several agonizing days, the man finally just died. His 
autopsy has not been made public, so we don't know for sure what actually killed him, although one could speculate he died of either dehydration or perhaps asphyxia from being trapped in this really tight space where his chest may not have been able to expand all the way, and so he would have eventually suffocated. Following the gruesome discovery, the dinosaur statue was removed from the front of the old theater. In the early 1980s, John Harder was the classic, athletic, popular kid at his high school in Delaware, Ohio, which is a relatively small town just outside of the state's capital. But unlike most stereotypes that paint high school jocks as being these total jerks that bully people and they're kind of stupid, John was none of those things. He was incredibly friendly and very warm-hearted and seemed to get along with everyone. John also was known for having a great sense of humor. In particular, he liked to play these kind of harmless pranks that would make people smile, like the time he very enthusiastically joined the cheerleaders during a high school pep rally, despite not actually being a cheerleader himself. John was set to graduate from high school on June 5th, 1983, and his plan was to study accounting at Kent State University the following year. A few weeks before his graduation, John's high school began selling these tickets to a grad night at a huge amusement park called Kings Island. Kings Island was located about two hours west of John's high school, and it was home to dozens of roller coasters, water slides, and many other attractions. During their so-called grad nights, this amusement park would shut down their public operations and not let anybody into the park that did not have these special student tickets that they gave to local area high schools. John, who was 17 years old at the time, was very excited at the idea of going to this grad night, and so he went and purchased tickets along with about 20 other students from his high school. At about 3.30 p.m., on on Friday, May 13th, John and the other students who had bought grad night tickets met up outside of their high school. While this was a school-sponsored trip, the students were responsible for driving themselves to the park. And so after all the students were accounted for, they all piled into a couple of their cars and they began their journey to the park. After a few stops along the way to get food and go to the bathroom, the students finally arrived at the park at about 7 p.m. And on the drive, John, who had been a passenger, had drank half a bottle of rum and about three to six beers. And so when he got out, he could barely stand, he was so drunk. And so the students made their way over to the front gate, they showed the attendant their grad night ticket, and they were allowed inside. And surprisingly, despite it being this special night where only people with these tickets were allowed in, it was still pretty crowded. There were lots of students that apparently wanted to come to this event. Once John and the rest of the students from the Delaware High School had come inside the park, there was no rule that they had to stick together for the duration of their time there. And so they all kind of broke into their separate groups and went their separate ways. In John's particular group was his girlfriend, Pam. And for the first hour they were in the park together, all they did was bicker and fight. Onlookers would say, John looked visibly upset and very emotional and very drunk. By 8.30 p.m., when John's group had gotten in line for this roller coaster, John was now openly saying, I don't want to be here anymore, I just want to go home. It was pretty obvious he was still just mad at Pam, and that's why he was saying all this, was just trying to make Pam feel bad. And so some of the group members told John just, hey man, calm down, you're overreacting, just try to enjoy this ride, and then afterwards we'll get some food, it'll be fine. But it was pretty clear that John was really worked up and seemed incapable of having a good time at this point. But regardless, John and the rest of the group, they got on this ride, at about 9 p.m. and then after the ride was over they disembarked and they walked away from the ride to regroup and figure out what was next and they're looking around and John is nowhere to be found and so after waiting for a few minutes and actually walking around looking for him they decided that you know what he was really upset before he got on this ride he probably just wanted to walk away and be by himself for a bit I'm sure we'll see him later in the night so John's group without John just continued going around the park going on different rides and for the next few hours they kind of forgot about John on. It wasn't until the end of the night when over the loudspeaker the park officials said okay we're closing the park now that they started walking out and wondering where John was. And they were convinced you know what I'm sure he's back at the cars he's probably waiting for us because he just wants to go home. And so they leave the park they get out to their cars in the lot and John's not there. And so at this point the group's starting to get a little bit concerned because no one knows where he is. They're meeting up with the other groups from their high school. No one's seen John and so they're all just kind of staring at the front gate waiting for John to come out but he doesn't. And then eventually the lights in the park start shutting down and the security guard comes out front and locks the front gate. And that's when the group knew they had a problem. After an extensive investigation by police, this is their best guess as to what happened to John. After John and his small group rode that roller coaster around
around 9 p.m. John very quickly disembarked the ride before anybody else in his group could see him, and then John stumbled his way towards the replica Eiffel Tower that this park was famous for. This tower stood at about 300 feet tall and was built to be an exact replica of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France, but this one at King's Island was only a third the size. It had three elevators that went up the center of the structure, and the elevators would stop at a 50-foot platform and a 275-foot platform where guests could look out and have a great view of the park. While today, the only way to access these two viewing platforms is through these elevators, at the time John was at the park in 1983, the park actually had a flight of stairs that went from the ground all the way to the very top of the tower that went right up the middle of the structure, and the public was allowed to take these stairs all the way up to the first platform, that 50-foot platform. And while the stairs did actually continue beyond that up to the 275 foot platform, the public was not allowed to go any higher on the stairs than that first platform. And so if you took these stairs, once you got to the 50 foot platform, there would be a big fence right on the stairwell preventing you from going any farther. And it says authorized personnel only, don't go any farther. And so the only people that would walk up those additional flights of stairs were staff that had a special key. When John stumbled his way over to the base of this replica tower, he did not get on an elevator. Instead, he took the stairs. So he made his way up to the 50-foot platform, and then when he got to the six-foot-tall gate preventing him from going any farther, he just climbed up and over it and continued walking up the stairs, and nobody stopped him. He finally came to a stop just below the 275-foot mark, and so he's on the stairwell. And at this point, he turns and faces the inside of the tower. It's all these metal beams all over the place, and he climbs over the railing of the stairs he's on, and he climbs onto this narrow beam that's actually a part of the support structure of this tower and he grabs onto the beam above him and just begins walking along this beam towards the center of the tower where the three elevator shafts are. Now there's no safety net on either side of John so if he slips and falls he's falling hundreds of feet to the ground and if he keeps walking and actually gets into the elevator shaft there's nothing protecting him from being struck by one of the elevators because the people who built this tower were not thinking about people walking on these exposed beams hundreds of feet up into the air. This is a totally dangerous and unauthorized area. But John just continues shimmying across this beam until he does get to the middle of the tower and now he's literally standing looking down into the elevator shafts. And as he's most likely looking around admiring where he was, one of the elevator cars below him began to start moving. To understand what happens next, you need to have a rudimentary understanding of how this elevator worked. A large metal rope was attached to the top of the elevator car, and from there it was thread up the elevator shaft all the way to the top where it was fed through a pulley that was anchored to the ceiling, and then that rope was fed right back down the shaft to the bottom where it was attached to a counterweight. A counterweight is just a large heavy weight that's designed to balance this elevator car on this pulley system. Without the weight, the elevator car would just slip off of that pulley. And so anytime the elevator car moved up, the counterweight would move down and vice versa, making sure that car was always balanced. And so John is standing right on the edge of this elevator shaft, presumably just kind of looking around, admiring where he was, when down below him, that elevator car starts to move and it starts to actually descend away from John. And so the car itself is not necessarily a threat to John. However, it's counterweight is because if the car is going down, it's count.
counterweight is going up, and it's right in the path of John. And so as John is leaning out over the shaft looking around, this counterweight comes screaming up and picks him off of the beam he's on and carries him up into the shaft. The impact on John was so strong that it's believed he was actually impaled on some of the exposed metal wiring on top of this counterweight, and he got totally tangled up in all of the cables on top of there. And so as John is desperately trying to free himself, the elevator operator, there was always a staff member inside of these elevator cars, he actually noticed when John got stuck on the counterweight. But of course, this worker would have no idea that's what it was. They would later recall, it just felt like the car suddenly jumped. And so this worker, fearing that something had gone wrong with the elevator car itself, he decided he would ride it all the way to the bottom, let everybody get out, and then ride back up to the top, totally empty, to make sure that the car actually worked before allowing people back on. And so the worker went to the ground, everybody got out, he closed the doors, he began his ascent, he got to that first platform at 50 feet, no issues, he got about 10 feet above that first platform, so at about 60 feet, when all of a sudden he hears an unbelievably loud thud on the roof of his elevator car, causing his car to immediately come to a stop. And then blood began pouring over the sides of the car over the windows. After getting stuck on the counterweight, John probably did everything he could to try to free himself, but he just couldn't do it. However, when that elevator worker decided to go back up again to test the capacity of the elevator car, it reversed the direction of the counterweight that John was stuck on. And so as that car was going up, John began going down and it was on this descent that parts of John's body must have been dangling off of this counterweight and they must have struck one of the beams as he was going down and that beam effectively pried him off of whatever he was stuck on and threw him over the edge into the center of the shaft. And so John would fall 200 feet and he would land on top of that elevator car, dying instantly. The park was very quick to block off the ride and the whole scene and got police involved very quickly. So only a very small number of guests and employees were aware an accident had even happened. And very few of them were aware that it had been a fatal accident. As for the police, they knew they had a dead body, but they had no way to identify the body. There was no ID cards on John. And so they had no way to let his friends know that were in the park or to tell his family. And so it wasn't until that night when John's friends are out in the parking lot waiting for John to come out again, that they got really worried and they went up and spoke to a security guard at the front of the park. And that security guard, after hearing their story, would tell them that actually there had been an accident in the park and there was a body and the police are still trying to identify this body. And so maybe you guys wanna go over to the hospital and see if it's your friend. And so sure enough, the friends went to the hospital and they would confirm that the body was John Carter. To this day, no one knows for sure why John did what he did. Some say he was just drunk and it was a dumb decision that led to his death. Others say he was suicidal, but many Many of the people that were close to him say, no way, he was not suicidal. And other people say, you know, John, he loved attention. And so perhaps this was a dangerous stunt gone too far. But regardless of his reasons, John had clearly intentionally entered an area that was off limits and it got him killed. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found